Yeah. Okay, council like to uh, call to order the regular council meeting for the uh, Tuesday afternoon, April 9th, 2024. This meeting is being, recorded, is being recorded live and is streaming on the District of Summerland YouTube channel. All representations to council, written or verbal, will form part of the public record and be available to the public for viewing electronically or as a written record. Corporate officer, any late items? There's no late items. But get an approval of the agenda, please. Councillor Peak, Councillor Van Elfin, all in favor? And that carries. Uh, consent agenda. Would anybody like to remove anything from the consent agenda? Don't see any. Get approval of the consent agenda. Councillor Peak, Councillor Van Elfin, all in favor? And that carries. Straight into our delegations, and we have the Okanagan Regional Library. So, welcome, ladies, and uh, just carry away. Thank you so much. All right. Yes. Okay. That seems to be working. Um, so thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council, for fitting us into your agenda. I suspect you have other matters to cover today as well, so um, we won't take too much of your time. Sorry, I'm just going to wrangle this a bit closer. There we go. Um, so my name is Danielle Hubbard. I'm the CEO of the Okanagan Regional Library. And as you're probably all aware, one of our most beautiful branches of the ORL is located here in Summerland, uh, which is where Caroline works as our community librarian. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ORL overall as a system, uh, what we do, how we're structured, what services we provide, and then Carolyn will speak to what's happening here in Summerland. Um, so first of all, I, I'm the relatively new CEO of the ORL. I took this role about a year and a half ago. So one of my initiatives over the next few months is to get out and visit all of our member communities. In a few minutes, I'll show you a map of where we're located, but we have 30 branches up and down the Okanagan Valley and beyond. Um, so getting out to visit all the councils is a bit of a geographic mission. Uh, so uh, another initiative that's been happening over the past several months at the ORL is a development of a new strategic plan. Um, so as is the case probably with many organizations, the ORL's last strategic plan kind of lay fallow during the COVID years. Our plan had expired, but it just was put on hold until the world reopened. Um, and I think the other reason it was valuable to develop a new strategic plan is that so many people have a very strong impression of what a public library is and what a public library does, uh, mostly involves books and quiet space, maybe some story times and book clubs. Um, but as the years go by, we're really doing so many things that are not just that traditional model. Um, and so I think it's important to reflect that. So our vision now is to provide a vital community space for learning, connecting, and exploring. And sorry, the text here is a little bit small on the screen, um, but these are our five goals of what we want to offer as an organization, uh, is to cultivate learning, literacy, creativity, and imagination, a lot of those traditional library services fall under this goal. So that's the delivery of books and the services and inspiring people to learn and read. Uh, but we also offer welcoming, inclusive space to gather and connect. Again, Summerland really has a leg up there by having one of our most beautiful branches in our system. Who would not want to gather there? Um, and we embrace local heritage and culture. So again, we have 30 branches in 24 different communities. So what that local heritage and culture looks like is different at each of our service points. Um, and we develop and nurture community partnerships. So the community partnership piece and the local heritage and culture piece is really where our community librarians, such as Caroline, that's the work that you and your colleagues are doing um, is really embedding themselves in the community and seeing what their communities need. Um, and we also strive for organizational and service excellence. That's a big part of what me and my administrative team do because this is what our service area looks like. <laughs> so um, the Okanagan Regional Library is one of the largest library systems in BC. I think there's only four systems bigger than us. 
We serve a population of over 400,000. Kelowna is our biggest community. Vernon's next biggest. And then we have many rural locations. Um, and so we serve four regional districts, Central Okanagan, North Okanagan, Okanagan Similkameen, and Columbia Shoe Swap. Um, so I, as CEO, report to a board of 24 elected officials. Um, Councillor Trainer is the representative from Summerland right now on the ORL board. Um, and so those uh, communities each appoint someone from their council to speak on the ORL board. I then report to that board and I then oversee all the staff and operations of the system. We currently have about 300 staff uh, and an operating budget of about 23 million. So some of the benefits, oh, that was very exciting. There's apparently a shelf underneath this table uh, for anyone who sits here next, it's still here. <laughs> um, so some of the benefits that are provided to communities by being members of the Okanagan Regional Library are really a consolidation of resources. So across the system, uh, we have just under 600,000 physical materials Lots of those are books, of course, um, but also DVDs, magazines. Caroline was just telling me magazines are a hot topic in Summerland. Mm -hmm. High demand. Okay. Not quite sure of all the drama there, but high demand. Um, and we also have a new collection called Library of Things. So that's a lending collection that is not books. It's kind of alternative forms of literacy. So there's financial literacy kits, a birding kit, radon detection kit, kind of this broad educational grab bag of other things people can borrow from us. Uh, and the, OR, the ORL also provides access to 144,650 digital materials um, at the time of writing this report. That number is always fluctuating. Um, but so that's eBooks, e-audio books, online databases, some of them educational, some of them entertainment based things people can access from their phones or listen to while they drive up and down the valley. Uh, and go, there we go. So another uh, way that we consolidate our resources to make things as cost effective as possible um, is that we have centralized service in our headquarter branch in Kelowna. So this is the building that I work out of most of the time. Um, our headquarters are on KLO Road. And so this is where our collections are purchased and then they're, they come in and they're processed and they're allocated out to all the branches. So at any one of our branches, you can place materials on hold from any of our other branches. It's called a floating collection. Um, so material travels all up and down the valley with the goal of having a fresh collection every time. So in a smaller community like uh, Headley, for instance, with a population of less than a thousand, there's still going to be different material every time someone goes and visits that branch. Ta -da. Um, so some of you might already be aware of this, some of you might not. So I thought I'd just speak briefly to how the library is funded. So according to the BC Public Library Act, which is the provincial legislation that governs public libraries in BC, um, then public libraries are funded largely through municipal tax levies. Um, so we as the ORL, we levy each of our member communities and it's on a per capita and land valuation basis. So essentially larger communities pay a higher levy towards the ORL. At the moment, Kelowna supports about 40% of our operating budget because they're our largest community. Um, and so then myself and my uh, finance director, we take that tax revenue in as revenue for the ORL, and then we apportion it out um, to all the branches in equal measure to how much we get from each branch. So we try to make it so that the branches, so the communities aren't subsidizing library service in the other communities. It's not exactly down to the penny accurate, um, but at least roughly that's what's happening. And there's, and then about 20% of our funding comes from a provincial grant with the little dribblings of funding from donors and grants that we apply for locally. And actually Summerland is a bit of an exception to that in that the new 
not that new anymore, the wonderful branch that we operate in Summerland, a giant chunk of that funding came from our Friends of the Library group, um, which was a volunteer group that took it upon themselves to raise money and do fundraising. And <laughs> some of you are nodding, like, you know, this is true. Um, so not all of our branches, not all of our communities are fortunate to have such an active volunteer base and active community support. Um, but Summerland has been amazingly supportive of library service. So we're very grateful for that. And going straight from financial models over to what's happening here in Summerland. Oh, my turn. Sorry, that was an awkward transition. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Good afternoon, your worship, Mayor Holmes, honorable council members. My name is Caroline McKay, and I am the community librarian at the Summerland branch of the Okanagan Regional Library. The last time I presented at a council meeting was January of 2020, shortly after I assumed my new role. So the past four years have been challenging but I'm cons consistently reminded about how important our public library is to our community's overall well being. We are a hub of activity, connection, and lifelong learning. It brings me great pleasure to report to you today that there is an unmistakable buzz in the air at our library. Over the past few months, staff have noticed a significant uptick, uptick in activity and engagement within our community. There's been an increased demand for in-person programs, study spaces, and partnership opportunities. The recent increase in foot traffic and participation in our programs has been remarkable, but we have been quietly nurturing this right from when pandemic restrictions lifted. Have you read the article in the Summerland Review about how our branch welcomes high school students into the library? We are fortunate that the high school is right opposite the library. They, they're invited to come in and eat their lunch on their lunch break. I know. <laughs> so we encourage teens to eat their lunch, socialize and study together, charge their cell phones, or just hang out. Between 20 and 30 teens are at the library every day at lunchtime. It, they just stream right in, a great big lineup. At 1 o'clock, you should come and see it. <laughs> so we aim to provide them an environment where they feel safe and supported. Summerland Branch also has a unique offering to youth in the community, community with our baskets of teen essentials. There's items that they may not, that they may need, but might not have access to. Toothbrushes, socks, hygiene supplies, deodorant, selection of food are always available. And we have a mysterious library patron that donates supplies to these teen essentials boxes. I don't know who it is, but I would like to thank them for their mm -hmm. generosity. But every now and then people will actually donate cash to us so that we can keep those boxes supplied. The library has successfully partnered with organizations, clubs, and local businesses to offer some amazing programs. The Truth and Reconciliation Learning Circle convenes on Tuesday evenings. We had six meetings in January and February with 173 people in attendance. In partnership with Interior Health, once a month we host a Lunch and Learn Guest speakers such as Giants Head School Breakfast Club, South Okanagan Immigrant and Community Services, SOICS, uh, District of Summerland, Parks and Recreation Department have given excellent inform informative and inspiring talks about their organizations. Bring a bag lunch to the library on Thursday, April 11th at 12 o'clock for Lunch and Learn with Work BC. So if you know anyone that's looking for some employment, come to the library. Chess Club has concluded Tuesday night sessions. All ages and skill levels are welcome to play chess together. We have people driving from Naramata to come to the Summerland branch to play chess. SOICS is offering free English classes two times a week to newcomers of Summerland. And Replenish Refillery is back again with another worm composting event at the library. Yeah, there's worms in the library. <laughs> Join them Thursday, April 18th at 6.30. Summerland branch registers an average of 50 new patrons per month. As of right now, we have 10,568 library card holders. One of my goals is to encourage residents to visit the library and register for a library card. There is just really something for everyone. Our annual people visits in 2021 was 38,033. 
people visits in 2022, 44,750. 2023, 55,188. So we can feel the momentum building again after the after the restrictions are lifting. In 2023, our talented staff presented 156 children's programs for 2,964 children between the ages of zero newborns to 12 years old. Preschool story time, toddler time, baby rhyme time are essential building blocks of literacy. Summer Reading Club is just around the corner. Stay tuned for our fun and exciting programs that kids keep kids reading over the summer holidays. So over the past couple of weeks, we had spring break. The, um, the library provided a monster mayhem reading challenge. So school age children could pick up a bingo sheet, complete the reading challenges, and then visit the library and spin the wheel of chance to win a prize. And if they got a bingo blackout, they received a free book to keep. We had prizes ranging from bookmarks and stickers to light up rings, suction cup monsters that we gave away. And I just counted the numbers. We had 323 children participating. The library was busy over those two weeks of spring break. We gave away hundreds of prizes. Parents told us that they really appreciate the creative ways that we keep their kids reading over the break. Um, we registered, I think I mentioned about 50 patrons per month in Summerland. In, in March, we registered 232. And that was probably in part thanks to the, to the reading challenge that we offered. April is National, National Poetry Month. Valley Voices on the Summerland Branch have invited two award-winning poets, Michael V. Smith and Carrie Gilbert, are reading their exquisite poetry on Saturday, April 27th at 1 p.m. Adults can register now for the poetry writing workshop, which takes place directly after the author visits. Wednesday, April 17th is National Canadian Film Day. We're hosting an in-person special screening of two Canadian films, an Indigenous film called Beans and another one called I Like Movies. I'm going to serve popcorn and refreshments. So on Wednesday from 2 to 6, the April 17th, you can come watch some movies. So I'd like to end my presentation with a little story. We recently had a Pro D Day Lego and Kiva Block Building Fun and Games Day with different activities set up in stations in the children's area. Two parents were sitting on the couch, relaxing in a sunbeam. And while their children bounced from station to station, they were just having a great time talking. On the way out the door, I overheard one of the parents say, I'm glad we came here. This was a really enjoyable way to spend our morning. So that phrase captures the essence of the Summerland Library. It's a memorable and enjoyable experience. Thank you, Mayor Holmes and esteemed council members. Thank you to both. I think my sister's involved in that Voices of the Valley thing. She doesn't really tell me anything, but I heard it through the grapevine. Uh, council, uh, any questions? Uh, Councilor Barkwell. I always thought there were always worms at the library. Bookworms. You know, um, when I was young, I spent a lot of time in libraries, university and stuff. Uh, and I wonder where people do their learning. I've got a friend who says uh, libraries are dinosaurs. They're a thing of the past now because we have Google and the internet, but that hasn't been the case. Do students still make, go to, you know, reference books as well as Google or how, you know, what, how's learning done these days? Do you want to? Oh. Sure. sure. We were worried too when digital books came on the scene, but I don't think we had anything to worry about. Physical collection is still used immensely as well as digital it's just a nice combination of the two and as for reference books they're there when people need them we have current copies of, of the essentials and uh summerland has a, an encyclopedic the big selection of encyclopedias that we let people take home and they go out surprisingly often so the encyclopedias still go home Councillor Bess. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, you know, I'm a regular user of the library, especially with my kiddos. We come there often. The spring break program was a big hit around my house. We completed the entire challenge in one day. We were back three times and it was the first day and the books weren't ready yet. So, um, <laughs> you know, these programs are are really important. And I and I thank you for being creative and, and keeping children and families engaged at the library. It's something that grows through a lifetime. My mom always took us to the library. Library. She is still a lifelong, like weekly library person, and that has now gone three generations and likely more. And that's because it, they continue to be relevant, safe spaces. I really like how you're welcoming teenagers into the space um, and just keeping people attached to um, these, these places that are safe spaces where you can go and learn and it be a place you know, with bathrooms and just safe spaces outside of sometimes physical activity. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so is your government funding um, tied to the number of users you have, number of people, library cards people take out? No, it's no. not. Uh, okay. Yeah. So our funding is according to the BC Public Libraries Act. So it's in provincial funding or provincial legislation that that's the way it goes. Um, so I guess one of the things that I often tell people is your your tax dollars are going towards your library, so you may as well use your library. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, also on on financing. So so you mentioned like Kelowna pays about forty percent. Yeah, but it is is it that everybody pays the same regardless of this based on assessment? So if I if you you know if my house is valued as same as a, somebody's house in Kelowna, we're, we're paying the same amount regardless of where we are in the region, or does it vary from? Um, Municipality, it's municipality. municipality to municipality. So it's an average of the land value of that municipality. So if you, for instance, um, Princeton is one of our communities that pays the lowest levy per capita to the ORL because their land evaluation is lower. And so everyone in Princeton pays the same amount, even if one person's house is worth this much and one person's house is worth this much, um, then that's still the ORL levies the community based on the average value, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Well, how, uh, how do you, um, so the differences between communities, how yeah. do you work that out then? Yeah, like, so that's, um, so the communities pay sort of between, I think our lowest paying are sort of in the $40 per capita range and the higher ones are in the $60 per capita range. So my CFO, whose name is Jeremy, he tracks all of it in a, in a massive Excel spreadsheet and probably other documentation as well. But so he tracks what our revenue is from each community and then he tracks what our expenditures are for each community. So that's everything from the cost of our leases, our utilities, our levels of staffing, um, to make them as close to equal as we can. I understand. Yeah. Anybody else? Councillor Peak. Thank you very kindly, Your Worship. Well, I want to congratulate you. I think our library is all the better because of the people who staff it and the people who come to it. And our friends of the library, you're right, they did a wonderful job. The contribution they made make it made such a difference. So our garden area and park area outside. The fact that the staff uh, bring all kinds of programming into the key, into the library space means that there are are users from the beginning of their life through. Um, when when the little kids are there, there's a lot of hubbub. The the opportunity because that building is in the center part of the community, which I know past councils have really endorsed. The design of the building makes it welcoming. It's it's more than traditional. It's just open to the whole air in the community. We are lucky to have the school there, but I really think it's the people that come in and the people that people that building. So I want to really compliment the staff. I think that supporting the library is a wonderful, it's a condition of living in the valley. And I think that's a very good condition to live in. Thank you very much for all the work you put in. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Turner. I'll just say one quick thing since I am on the board. Um, I, I absolutely, um, I love our library and I'm so glad to hear that the numbers continue to go up because I think um, people are um, tired of like what they see on their phones and computers and social media. And I think that they just want a safe place where they can go and access ideas 
And I love that the books are always rotating. Like every time I go in there with my kids, there's new books. You always have new books in the display. And um, it's just a place where there's so many ideas. And I love the fact that they're not limited and that all points of view are represented in our library. So um, I'm just so glad that it kind of brings me hope that um, the numbers still continue to go up because I think people need that connection and they, they just want to have access to information um, and enjoy it, you know, as opposed to just getting one thing that they see on social media or whatever, you know? So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions. <laughs> so uh, I've always wondered, how do you decide uh, what to materials to purchase, you know, for lending? I mean, is there some <laughs> sort of central library uh, purchasing place that they recommend what you buy? And, mm -hmm. and uh, also how many copies of each material? Because I guess, uh, you know, when you have a new book, everybody wants it. So you have, but, but after a year or two, nobody will want it anymore. And so how do you judge, you know, whether you buy eight copies and, and how do you factor all that into it? And that's a complicated formula, I'm sure, but. Yeah, that's okay. I can respond to it. Um, so we have staff who work at our Kelowna headquarters is where our collection department works. So we have a librarian who's our head of collections. Her name's Lisa. So she does a lot of this work that you're describing. I guess I think of it as like, a combination of science and um, sort of psychic intuition. <laughs> so um, when she she and her team select what material to purchase, a lot of it is based on um, manuals that come out from publishers of what books are available. They'll take into account how well books are reviewed. Are they, you know, are they reviewed positively? Are they reviewed heavily to try to guess, I guess, about what people are going to be wanting to read. Um, we also make a significant number of purchases based on suggestions for purchase, we call them. So where anyone from any of our communities can write in, they can fill out a form saying, please buy such and such. Um, and again, we'll look at it in the same way. Like, is this book legitimately published? sort of off the shelf self-published books we're less likely to acquire because sometimes people are requesting that we publish them because in fact they wrote that book. So those ones we're less likely to publish or less likely to purchase. Um, and then in terms of quantity, there is a formula that Lisa uses that I don't know off the top of my head of approximately how many we provide based on the size of our community. And we certainly try to do our best to anticipate if a book is going to be busy, it's going to be popular, we buy more copies, but the collection department will also run a monthly holds report, they call it, so they can see how many books in the system have holds lists on them. So this is a thing we struggle with sometimes is that a book will suddenly get picked for like the Oprah book list or nominated for an award and then suddenly it has 30 holds on it when the day before it had won. Um, so then we will madly go out and buy as many more copies as we can. And usually at the end of that book's run of popularity, some of those books are just worn out and we end up donating them to friends of the library or throwing them out. Um, because yeah, it can be a challenge. Sometimes we can like this book was incredibly popular three years ago and now we have 50 copies of it. So yeah, usually we donate it to our friends of the library groups and they see if they can sell it at a book sale or make use of it in some other way. Yeah, so it's kind of a combination of <clears throat> formulas and guesswork. Yeah. Trial and error, I guess. So uh, thank you very much. That's great. And anybody else? No? Okay, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you. And 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 our community librarian is awesome. So. She is, she is definitely, I shouldn't have favorites, but she's one of my favorites. Oh, so, you. Yeah, you and your team. Thank yeah. you. That's great. Thank you. Can we now uh, public comment uh, opportunity for any agenda item? No? Move on to our business items, the uh, BC Zero uh, Carbon Step Code. And our sustainability coordinator will take this.
All right, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, so I'm presenting uh, on the zero carbon step code. I also have our building official here, Dimitri, who's gonna provide support. Um, he'll be available for the entire presentation and question period afterwards. So if I can answer it, I will most likely pass it on to him. So for today, um, I'm going to be providing just uh, the intent of the report that I've provided to Council, as well as an overview of the Zero Carbon Step Code, uh, Council Committee feedback, as we did bring this back to two of our Council Committees, as well as uh, recommendations for implementation in Summerland, as well as um, why uh, we would want to have it and the feasibility of it in Summerland as well. And then at the end, I'll provide the uh, staff recommendations, which are also in the report. So for today's presentation and in the report as well, I'll just be providing a high level overview of the zero carbon step code, uh, because the intent of this report is just to provide some recommendations uh, prior to any kind of implementation of the actual code. Uh, this is very high level overview. Um, and if there is a request for further information that can be uh, provided as needed. Uh, as well as the feasibility of implementation in Summerland for the zero carbon step code in context with what the zero carbon step code is, what other communities have been doing to date uh, since last May when it was originally announced, and then as well as uh, recommendations and suggestions for engagement with the public, uh, which is one of the recommendations from the report. So in 2018, uh, the energy step code, uh, as we know it today, uh, was incorporated in the BC building code. Uh, between that time and before, there was a lot of engagement with the province and various communities to understand uh, and uh, be able to correctly implement the energy step code. Uh, for us in the District of Sunland in 2022, we did two, a two-step process for adopting it. Uh, we did it first in March with the step one for part nine buildings, which are many of our residential buildings. And then in September, we had the step three for part nine, which is actually what was adopted and mandated through the province the, uh, the following year. So May 1st, 2023, last year, the BC uh, Building Code made it mandatory that all Part 9 buildings comply with the Energy Step Code, uh, as well as Part 3 buildings uh, to Step Code 2, and Part 9 was Step Code 3. In that announcement, there was also information shared with the Zero Carbon Step Code and what that was, as well as options for what communities could do um, at this point. Uh, it is currently optional uh, to adopt it. It is in the BC Building Code, but the province has not announced any mandatory requirements to meet certain uh, emission targets as per the Zero Carbon Step Code. So we are able to adopt it early before they provide those. Uh, they haven't done anything yet uh, at the time of the report and that today's date, we haven't seen anything either. So we're still kind of in this process where all communities are just kind of adopting it um, on their terms and waiting for the province to eventually provide those mandates. So what the zero carbon step code de uh, does is it basically provides uh, emission targets for part nine and part three buildings um, to basically reduce emissions through rebuilding mechanical systems. So hot water, heating uh, and cooling. Uh, so those targets are uh, outlined specifically for part nine and part three buildings. So our residential and then our kind of more complex uh, non-residential and some higher density residential buildings. So both the energy step code, which has already been in place since 2018, as well as the zero carbon step code are part of the process and time frame for the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030, which indicates uh, that all new buildings will be net zero ready uh, by 2030. So this is part of a larger provincial initiative to basically move forward with residential and non-residential buildings to reduce emissions in those uh, structures. So with that in mind, because we already have the energy step code and we've done a lot of work uh, to implement it, both here at the District of Summerland, but also the province and many other communities, that still is in play. Everything that the province has mandated, as well as whatever communities have gone above and beyond what the province has mandated as of last year on May 1st, that is still in play in tandem with the zero carbon step code. Because the province has not yet mandated specific emission targets for buildings, uh, for new buildings, Anyone that decides to adopt early and adopt at whatever emission level they would like to choose, that is then in tandem with the energy step code. So both of those are intended to work together. You address energy efficiency from a building standpoint, and then you address the emissions component, which is not necessarily captured 
at the energy step code level. So they're both two really important components and tools as part of the clean, uh, the clean BC roadmap to 2030. So these emission level targets that I've been talking about, this is kind of just a nice visual of what it looks like. Uh, we have our EL1 or emission level one, which is just measure only. The city of Penticton currently does this. They have mandated that for 2024. And then I believe they're looking at EL2 for 2025. Uh, EL2 essentially goes up one step so that you need to require electrification uh, for space heating or domestic hot water, but you can still use some sort of fossil fuel. The emission target is just low enough that you can still do a mix and still potentially meet those emission targets. When you get up to EL4, it's pretty close to electrification, if not fully electrified uh, for your part three or part nine buildings. So the, uh, si the mechanical systems in a house and a new build must meet that emission target and many times you have to go full electrification in order to do that. So this is not necessarily, the zero carbon set code does not require you to go um, electrification fully until you get to that particular level. And it's still, and it doesn't restrict the type of fuel. It just wants you to meet a specific emission level uh, for each of those buildings. So with regards to uh, communities that have already implemented, uh, a majority of them are on the lower mainland and in the island. Uh, many of them worked in cohesion with the Clean BC uh, Roadmap 2030 uh, document, as well as uh, councils and committees for that particular document. Uh, so they tended to be early adopters of it. Uh, so many of them announced that last year in May and June. Uh, so we can see if this is just an abbreviated list. It's not everyone comprehensively, but for the most part, it shows what's been adopted to date uh, with many of them going up to step three and even, I'm sorry, uh, emissions level three and emissions level four. Uh, there has been some adoption into the Kootenays. We've had Nelson uh, out there as well who have adopted. And then here in the interior, we've had Penticton, which is, as I mentioned previously, they've got EL1 currently for measure only for 2024 uh, with the intents for EL2 next year for 2025. So what are some of the potential uh, considerations and impacts of the zero carbon step code? So... <clears throat> Between the communities that have already done work uh, to engage with their communities, so the island and the lower mainland, a number of them produced reports or studies or staff reports to kind of summarize engagement that they've already done. So that gave us at the district level just some good information and kind of some uh, overview as to what we might expect if we were to go through that process as well. So in many cases, uh, the industry had concerns with costs, both from the building standpoint of how much it'll cost in addition to the baseline building, as well as for uh, homeowners and utility costs that come with potential partial or full electrification of a building, depending on what the emissions level uh, is chosen by a community. Uh, in many cases, uh, reports both at the provincial level and at the local level showed that there was a very small incremental construction cost associated with the adoption of the zero carbon step code. Uh, so at this point, many communities have not seen that as a hindrance. Uh, with regards to homeowners, utility costs really do vary. It depends on the house, depends on how it's built and the design of it as well. So there's a lot of components that play into it. Uh, but based off of, again, another report done by the province and the third party, it did show between a savings of 18% in your utility costs to a potential increase in 30% of your utility costs. So again, this really varies, depends on the house, the climate that you're in. Uh, for Summerland, we were very fortunate that this report was able to provide it for our climatic zone. Um, but again, just need to see how it works on the ground. But for the most part, that's kind of the range that we're seeing and that's what they've modeled. So at this point it is modeling. We haven't seen actual data from a, homes that are built with the zero carbon step code. And I think that'll be really important for the future and long-term maintenance and um, monitoring of something like this uh, to actually see what those actual numbers are versus what modeling uh, has been shown. So with regards to the availability of equipment, uh, for the most part, we see uh, we don't really have any major concerns with that. Um, most of the available equipment is related to key pumps. They are widely available uh, for builders and homeowners. Uh, and most homes are already built with heat pumps serving as a cooling system. So they can be switched if you get someone to come in and do that for you. Um, but generally this is also new homes. So when you have a new build, you can request as part of that emissions level that you wanna meet. 
Uh, with regards to low confidence in technology, um, with the requirements for heating a home potentially fully electric, uh, that is new, but the idea of uh, basically having an electric system is not. So we do have that capacity, and we also do have heat pumps and systems that can work down to negative 25 degrees Celsius. The odd time that we get that here, you know, our weekly deep freeze that we get in the winter, uh, we do have heat pumps available in the province, in the community that can meet those requirements. Uh, lastly, for electrical capacity, again, this varies. We have our own utility. We buy from Fortis. We resell it. Uh, in talking with our director of utilities, there were no concerns at this point in time for the ability to for the district of Summerland to serve the community moving forward, um, based off of what we know about our housing, uh, the rate of housing increases and building, uh, and also our current electrical capacity that we have and what is currently being used. So we don't have any concerns from the district side of, uh, of electrical capacity. So in addition to researching what other communities have done and reports and modeling that's been done in order to understand how the zero carbon tech code might impact uh, housing and that industry, we also brought this to two council committees. So the Development Process Improvement Advisory Committee and the Community Climate Action Advisory Committee. So for each of those parties, uh, we received some comments from them. So they're just summarized up on the board there. But we did see some patterns where, you know, there are still concerns from both of those committees with the cost to home builders and to residents uh, when it comes to implementing it and how that looks for new builds. Um, and then there is also concerns with making sure that there is enough communication to the public, both from the industry standpoint with the builders community, but also from residents as well, making sure that residents and new homeowners that are looking to build new homes also understand what that means for them, but what is the zero carbon step code and pros, cons, benefits, things like that. Um, so those comments were taken into consideration and because they did kind of reflect what we've seen as well with previous engagement from other communities in BC, uh, we were pretty confident that we had, uh, you know, a good understanding and good reference points for, for those comments as well. So with regards to Summerland, uh, the implementation in Summerland is feasible. Uh, there really isn't anything that's stopping us from adopting it, uh, because if we don't adopt it in advance, we just have to wait for the province to mandate it. So we do have this option if we do want to go forward with it uh, from council's perspective. Um, with regards to just engagement and how we want to move forward, staff are recommending that we do proceed with engagement first before we come back to council with recommendations for what level uh, we so choose to move forward with uh, for the zero carbon step code. So uh, in our recommendation, um, we want to go to local industry and home builders. So go to them, speak to them and provide opportunities for them to learn, understand what the zero carbon step code is that they don't know about it already. And then also just provide information as to how it might impact them or not impact them um, and just take any feedback from them and use that as a way to formulate our recommendation to council uh, if they so choose to move forward with uh, some sort of adoption of the zero carbon step code. Uh, the other session would be for just homeowners and residents. So if they are looking to build a new home, looking to just understand and get you know up to date on what this uh, what the zero carbon step code is, we do want to provide at least two sessions for the public as well and just have it as an open house style. Come in, ask questions, provide information. Um, at this point, it's a provincial. Um, adoption of the BC Building Code, a section of it. So we don't really have a choice to whether it actually moves forward or not. It's already at that stage. So we just want to make sure that we're informing them and just providing information where necessary. Ideally, we'd like to do this between uh, the months of May and June, uh, based to start off of today's date and how long it would take to prepare materials and get things ready and get things announced and make sure there's sufficient time frames for them to know when this, these two or four events are going to be happening. So May and June is what we would like to see. So with that being said, staff have two recommendations for council. Uh, that is that uh, council direct staff to conduct engagement with the public about the upcoming changes to the BC building code for the zero carbon step code. And that staff then provide recommendations to council in consideration of the feedback uh, and or concerns raised from those engagements uh, so that you are fully informed and uh, can proceed and direct staff uh, with the zero carbon step code and how you would like to move forward with it. And that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Council, any questions? Councillor Patton. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great presentation. 
great presentation. Um, you were talking about cold climate heat pumps. So cold climate heat pumps go to minus 31. At minus 20, they start reducing their efficiency, right? So what you're asking for in EL2 is you're taking, you, you're looking at taking out space heating, but allowing a fossil fuel hot water tank and cooking appliance. So my question is, uh, a high efficient furnace at minus 20 is 97% efficient compared to a reduction from minus 20 to 30. Uh, so uh, a gas of furnace is actually more efficient and cost effective than a heat pump. But anyway, here nor there. One of the things in regards to your um, report from the development process committee was the development process committee said to do an EL1. And that's not in your report. So um, I think uh, the BC and I've got part 10 open, 10 threes open on my computer here in regards to it through the BC building code. And um, I think that um, we have to be very careful except for Nelson, everything on the lower mainland runs on the Vancouver building bylaw that has nothing to do with the British Columbia building code. Uh, there's municipalities there that have adopted the same um, uh, outcomes of the Vancouver building bylaw because of the close proximity. So I think we have to be very careful that when we move away from the lower mainland, our, our, our design temperatures do change. And as our design temperatures change, in some cases, I, I, I have a hard time uh, saying let's eliminate in Summerland fossil fuels for heating when it could be actually the opposite of driving the prices up. And so um, that, was, that was a couple of the things. Um, the other one that um, I wanted to bring your attention, you talked about the electrical division. I just talked to Graham last week about a customer that wanted to upgrade and he was told that his transformer was gonna cost him $12,000. So he chose against it. Now Graham came in and we've made, we've, we've remediated that situation. But the, the, what I'm getting at is you cannot say there isn't cost implication because there is. And uh, as this week, I spoke to Eager Electric and uh, Power Trends Electric about doing work in Summerland. And they said working with our electrical department was the hardest municipality in the lower, in, in, in the Okanagan that they have to deal with in regards to power. So I think we have to be very careful on the road that we take. I think it's great that we get public input, but on the other hand, I think we can't spin it that it's, it's, it's coming. It's coming through the BC building code. And I think what we have to be very careful of, I'm, I don't know if you remember, but back in the day for hot water solar, it was the same thing through solar BC. A municipality could opt into hot water solar. And what that, and then um, it, Kelowna did, I was part of Kelowna when we adopted that. We were the only municipality in the, in the Okanagan that adopted that. And it drove the cost up. And the cost was because now you had to have your trusses designed to a specific um, load uh, for weight, which no other municipality did. And then it went away. Now, you, now it's still in their bylaw, but so solar BC is no longer around. Anyway, I'm verbal diarrhea, but um, I, I, I like the idea of going to the public, but I think that we really have to be careful in our climate zone that um, we don't push people to something that actually is more expensive in the short term. It's coming by 2030 anyways. Um, and, and I think we just have to be careful on what we mandate to our, our builders and our, and our citizens. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, you want to respond to that, Dimitri? Go ahead. Thanks, Councillor Patton. I just a couple comments to go off um, your comments. Uh, heat pumps reducing their efficiency to about minus 20. Um, there's multiple ways, there's multiple pathways you can reach these goals. One is by defining the system you're going to electrify, hot water tank, the space heating, and your cooking system. 
The other is by um, modeling the maximum greenhouse gas emissions per house, and you get a level there. And the other is a combination of the maximum greenhouse gas and the greenhouse gas intensity based on your square footage. So the simplest way to look at it is you electrify one system or two system or all of them based on the steps. But there's other pathways where you can go with a combined system for your space heating, for instance. Electrification, a heat pump for the majority of the season, a gas furnace for the really cold days. And that way you get your emissions reduced, but you still get kind of the efficiency of both systems. That's definitely a possibility. Um, and that's something homeowners can decide on with their builder and their um, modeler. Um, as far as Vancouver building bylaw versus BC building code, um, they say it's in part 10, it's in part 10.3 and part 9.37 of the building code already. Uh, the table, they've got EL1, 2, 3, 4, and like Odess was saying, um, it, at this current time, you don't have to do any of that. So it, it is in the building code. Um, our um, uh, environmental data is in our building bylaw, so that's still there. We would reference that like we do with the energy step code. Um, so as far as I see that not being an issue, um, but I just wanted, I do want to clarify, that's not just we're, we're picking a system and saying, okay, that's going to be electric. You can base it off the total kgs or intensity of kgs per floor area of a building. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, you're right. And your energy advisor will, every, every residential property is going to require, has a, has a, an energy advisor and that energy advisor by the push of a button can tell you what your greenhouse gas emissions are based on that report. That's what we were, you know, that's what came out of the development process. Um, and um, you're right. Our, our climatic data here is minus 20 in, in our area. So um, the question being is, is now you're all, you're into a cold climate heat pump here and how many cold climate heat pumps are being installed? That's another story because the, the, the most heat pumps that are being installed right now are minus 15 Celsius. And so in the cold weather, once it hits minus 20, then it can't even provide the heat for those, for those, uh, for those properties. Now, whether you go to a ductless system or whether you go to a fan coil system in regards to your heat pump is two different, uh, you know, two different areas. But I agree, you know, you go into a fan coil and you're requiring electric backup heat, right? Every 3000 kilowatts or every kilowatt is 3300, 3400 BTUs that you're going to have to put into that. But anyway, um, I think it's great the direction we're going. I think we just have to be very careful on um, on what we mandate to our to our, our community. Okay, thank you, Mr. Delavid. Yeah, I just wanted to, if I can, to council, remind kind of council what we're recommending today, uh, which is to start engagement. Um, we, we haven't necessarily, we don't really know the necessary, the right path for us to go forward with, with early adoption of zero carbon step code. We have one recommendation from the Development Process Improvement Committee. We have an opposite recommendation from the Climate Action Advisory Committee, two different perspectives to council. We want, we want to hear more from the industry group uh, and our builders and report back to council. And we do know one thing and that this is coming. This is coming from the province and it will be coming in the next few years. We haven't figured out exactly what date it will come, but it will be coming. So how quickly we want to move forward to inform our building community is kind of the question that we need to ask ourselves. Uh, and so we hope to start with engagement first on that question. Thank you. Councillor Peak. I, I appreciate the discussion. I understand the discussion. I'd like to bring the recommendation forward as stated in the report. Could I look for a seconder? A seconder, please. Councillor Shainer, go ahead. I think the opportunity to go out to our public and engage them in the process so they better understand it and will receive their comments back is really, really important. 
where we go from there will depend in part on what we hear from our public. But the educational process is really important. So I'd like to see us get started on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Barkman. Uh, I think I agree with the general trend of the discussion here. I, I think we were early on the low-hanging fruit aspects of this, but uh, these other refinements uh, are, are complicated and things don't seem to work with all due respect to Mr. Patton, who used to be involved in installing these peat bumps and things uh, and sales. So they, they don't always work the way they're supposed to, at least from what I hear. And, and you know, there's warranties and things, but um, I don't think we want to be on the on the bleeding edge of uh, adopting this this the technology. Uh, and that's why the government is given until 2030. Uh, they recognize that there's a certain teething process involved in all of this. So um, going cautiously and um, incrementally, um, I agree. So I support the motion and take it from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Betts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to disagree at this time with um, that recommendation. Um, I, I actually would go with option number three, which is that we follow the provincial mandates for the zero carbon step code. Now, I know the motion's on the table, um, but the reason that I'm saying this is that the province is going to be coming forward this year with recommendations. So to start our public consultation process before these recommendations come forward, seems like we could be providing information that's off base from what the provincial recommendations are. Um, it feels as though um, in the instance of short-term rentals, the district consulted publicly for a year and a half to try and get our policy correct and went through a lot of engagement and time and staff time was committed to solve this problem because there was no leadership on this issue from the province. Um, and then the province came in with a decision which has now guided all communities forward in their policy development, um, which would have actually saved our community countless hours mm -hmm. and council countless, countless time. So to me, I would prefer that we wait until the announcements are made of what is expected before we begin our consultation process. Um, that's a very good point, uh, but I also see the um, consultation as an education process too. So while we're, you know, we're, it's going to be a two-way street there, where it's partly letting everybody know what's coming down the road. We may adopt, well, you know, we, we may not go with anything faster and sooner than what the province mandates, but it's a good opportunity to sort of bring everybody up to speed on this whole thing and have a conversation about it. Yeah, I'm not sure if the, the short-term rental analogy is, I'd push back on that. I, I would say what we did is we, is we were able to get out in front of it. And, and so when that legislation did come down, we were there already, we were prepared. When I see like what's happening at the RDS right now, who who are now confronted with this legislation, and they haven't done any of the work that we did. They 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 are they have a huge uphill um, climb. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting out in front of these things. Um, I I would uh, I would also say that uh, I think it's 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 kind of good uh, just the reality of of who we are to to keep in step with Penticton. And um, because we there's many of the same builders, right? Same building community. And uh, so they've moved to, to level one, the monitoring stage. So I think it would make sense for us to, you know, think in terms of that, that we, we, we go along with Penticton. So uh, anyone else? I'll call the question then. All in favor of the motion that's on the table. Any opposed? Councillor Betts is opposed. Motion carries. Uh, moving on to the uh, holiday special events free bus fare and Odessa, back to you. So I don't have a presentation for this, um, but uh, for the staff report, uh, council, or sorry, not council, uh, staff is just asking for council's uh, 
or providing a council recommendation that uh, the that they proceed with providing free fair uh, on Canada Day as well as for youth and senior week in May and June. Um, so the background on this is that uh, typically um, outside of Summerlin's free fair transit, which is now uh, being implemented up until April 22nd, and then it moves to its permanent uh, place in the district, um, there is additional connections between our regional Route 30 and Penticton's local routes that they have in the town or in the city of the Penticton, and they are providing free transit for everyone on Canada Day, as well as for youth uh, during their Youth Week in May, and then for seniors in their Seniors Week in June. Uh, while we are providing free transit for Summerlin residents only on Route 30, that does not include any non-Summerlin residents. Uh, so the idea behind the staff recommendation is that we provide continuity with the city of Penticton uh, so that Penticton uh, residents or anyone traveling on our route that is not a Summerlin resident is able to access uh, the Route 30 during Canada Day and then also any seniors that are coming from Penticton or any other non-Summerlin residents that are using Route 30 are able to use it during Seniors Week and the same goes for Youth Week as well. Uh, so really this is capturing the non-Summerlin resident uh, demographic, um, but also ensuring that when uh, our system connects with Penticton's in the local city, uh, that there is uh, at least continuity during those three events and that, or sorry, those two events and the one holiday. Um, with regards to uh, the rest of the year, we're still implementing our free transit post April 22nd, uh, so that will still be applicable. Uh, for costs, uh, it doesn't cost anything to us in the sense that we are not adding anything to uh, staff's desk for costs, but uh, there will just be potentially a small increment, like a small incremental uh, revenue loss if we do have additional people using our Route 30 during those two events on that one holiday. Uh, I imagine Canada Day will be quite busy for anyone that is going back and forth between Penticton and Summerland. Uh, for the events that are occurring in both of those communities. Um, yeah, other than that, um, there were no major concerns. And because we were made aware of this through BC Transit, staff felt that it was an opportunity for us to also connect with the city of Penticton and just provide uh, an opportunity to connect with them while they're doing those events. We can also tag along for, for any of their residents or anyone else who's traveling that isn't in Summerland. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Markwell. I would move the staff recommendation and ask that staff emphasize that we are extending our already free transport to non-residents. Second, Councillor Chair. Okay, uh, any uh, further discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, none opposed. That carries. Uh, 2024 water and sewer <clears throat> parcel tax review panel. Um, Director of Finance. Thank you, Mayor Holmes. Uh, so during the 2024 utility budget deliberations, Council chose to re-establish the uh, $200 sewer parcel tax for a four-year period starting in 2024. <laughs> Uh, as this is considered a uh, first year parcel tax that's going to be charged to residents, uh, the community charter does require that the property is being charged, the tax be placed on our sewer parcel tax roll, and further that the roll must be reviewed and authenticated by a parcel tax roll review panel. So we have mailed out letters already, uh, we're getting phone calls. And we'll also be advertising uh, in the newspaper on the 18th and the 25th to meet our statutory obligations. And you know, the purpose of the parcel tax role review panel is to review the roles, uh, consider any owner complaints, make any corrections and authenticate that role. So the recommendation before council is that that parcel tax role review panel meeting be held on Monday, April 29th at 1245. And that three council members be appointed to the panel. Thank you. Okay, so that would be just before the regular council meeting we have on that day. So you're coming here anyway. Um, does, uh, who wants to be on this panel? You're on it? Okay, so Councillor Van Elfen, Councillor Patton, Councillor Trainer. Um, we'll put those, somebody want to put those names forward or does somebody else want to be on as well? Okay, Councillor Trainer will move that. Uh, second. Councillor Betts. Okay, um, questions, discussion? 
I'll call the question. All in favor? And none opposed. That carries. Did you get that corporate officer, the three names? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take a little break. 2.15? Sure. Yeah. Okay, we're right on time here. Thanks.
Uh, corporate officer. Uh, thank you, Mayor Holmes. So before council are the required bylaws to initiate the local local area service petition against process for the Deer Ridge sewer project. The district has identified a local area service for the Deer Ridge sewer area, which currently includes 112 properties to bring municipal sanitary sewer services to the subject area. To do so, council can initiate the establishment of a local area service by providing an opportunity for a petition against the proposed service, which means the bylaw cannot be adopted if at least 50% of the owners representing at least 50% of the assessed value of land and improvements would be subject to the petition to the local tax and sign a petition opposing the local area service. Council provided authorization to begin the process at its July 18th, 2023 council meeting. The next step in the process, including council to provide three readings to the local area service establishment bylaw as before council, giving notice of the petition against, uh, which will be in the upcoming editions of the Summerland Review, and by the corporate officer mailing the council initiative petition against package to all the parcels and property owners identified in the local area service, which will happen at the end of this week. The period for the petition against must be open for 30 days following the second publication of the required notice. Additionally, the district will require long-term borrowing to fund a portion of the project. A loan authorization bylaw has been prepared to authorize the district to borrow the necessary funds of up to $2,225,000 to complete the project. The funds will be recovered by a parcel tax on the participating parcels in the area over a 20-year amortization period. It is anticipated that the cost will be approximately $19,866 per parcel. The estimated cost of the property owners in the local area service will be approximately $1,613 per year should they choose not to pay the portion, um, their portion as a one-time cash payment. The next steps for this bylaw include sending um, the bylaw to the province, to the inspector of municipalities. This will be done following council providing three readings and at the same time, the petition is mailed to the residents within the local area service. It should be noted that the, guess, the estimated costs for the project have increased since being introduced to council in July, 2023 for a variety of reasons, including anticip anticipated material, and pr material price and labor increases for working late 2024 and 2025 additional rock work required following geotechnical investigations and increased pipe size to ensure pipe capacity at full build out following the announcement of the new provincial legislation. The original borrowing amount proposed was 1590000 1, as of July 18th, 2023, and has increased to 2225000 uh, for the reasons I just identified. And this does increase the cost to the property owners from uh, to that 19,000 from approximately 16,000. We do have Joe, our Director of Utilities and our Director of Finance uh, with me to answer any questions that council may have. Okay, thank you. And uh, Bobby's here as well. Uh, so uh, council, any questions? Councilor Patton. Uh, thank you, Worship. Joe, uh, once the sewer line goes in, is it then it's classified as a, a sewer spec area and, any, and if a private sewage system was to fail, they would have to connect to that uh, uh, to that sewer line. Am, am I on the right track, or are they would they be allowed to fix their private sewage system and not tie to the municipal system? A good question through the mayor. Uh, my understanding, actually, I spoke with the director of utilities today about that, and is uh, there's 60 days following um, us confirming that the sewer is available to any residents them to actually tie into the the sewer system so the idea would be that they would tie in um, fairly shortly after we complete the project i'm not sure if that was your question so let's say within 60 days they didn't but then let's say a year down the road their private sewage system failed they would still have the opportunity to tie in and would it be a latecomer fee then so they, they would have the opportunity to tie in. However, um, it wouldn't. So this is a, a new development you're talking about or an existing? And, and exists. So we, we, we have the sewer that's going into Deer Ridge. Yeah. And so we already have existing homes there on private sewage. If their private sewage failed and it wasn't within the 60 days that you're speaking of, let's say it's a year later, they would, would, they, they would still be able to tie into that system um, but there would be a latecomer, so nineteen thousand or sixteen thousand dollars for a connection. So everybody within that local area service, regardless of whether they tie in or not, will pay the nineteen thousand. So there would be no latecomer on that. It everybody pays up front or not up front the the nineteen thousand, 
either upfront or through the 20 year period. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Councillor Betts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So actually, can you, Joe, please just illuminate what the process would actually be for the residents if the local area service is to be approved? Can you just go through step by step what happens first and who do we build out the sewer to each person's house? Are we going into the neighborhood and doing all this work? How does it work? Good question. There's a, a lot to that from this, starting out with the local area service what we're doing right now. But once the local area service has been established and approved by the residents, we'll have a design complete for that whole entire area that's uh, highlighted in the package you have there. We'll tender that project. So the district will do that entirely with our own forces and our engineer that we've got on retainer. Um, then we'll go ahead and build it so that the construction will happen if all, everything goes according to plan, the fall of this year and the start of next year, depending on when they start this fall, will, will dictate how far into next year we go. Um, once the whole project's been built out, there will be a sewer line connecting to all of those parcels. So each of those parcels will have access to that sewer. We will leave um, a sewer connection at their property line. So the district will have the main line that runs down the, say, the middle of the road, and then we'll have the connection to each property that just goes to the property line. At the property line, it's then the homeowner's responsibility to um, decommission their septic tank and tie into this, uh, it's called an inspection chamber, but uh, the, the sewer tie-in that we have there. So that'll be their responsibility on top of the, the $19,000 that they'll have to pay. They'll have to tie in their sewer to that, uh, to our system. And just to follow up, so um, the timeline for that connection to happen is up to the homeowner? To the mayor, that's something that we looked at. I actually just refreshed today uh, with our director of utilities, and uh, I believe it's they have 60 days from when our project is complete to, to do the tie-in for their sewer. Um, that's something we have to look at internally just to make sure that's reasonable, you know, uh, for this uh, project. But I believe that's what the sewer bylaw st states at this time. So it, it is something we will look at. Thank you. Um, just to follow up. So I realize that's what you were saying to Councillor Patton. But so, you know, say there might be residents who had a septic issue within the last five years and have had to do upgrades at their own cost in that time. I understand this is going to benefit the com their community, especially their rich neighborhood. In the long run, it's going to save homeowners in the long run a lot of money. But for somebody who's had to do repairs recently and has a system that's up to date, are they? is it an obligation to tie in within 60 days or do, you, do residents do it as time passes and connect as like they still have to pay starting 2024 if it goes through, but can they connect as needed with time? That's not what the way the bylaw currently reads, but that's something that we're going to have to look at and we'll bring back to council to, to determine what, uh, what we do with that. The bylaw right now states 60 days from when we've completed the, when we've turned it over so they have access to the sewer to their property. So that would be sometime in the middle of next year, likely. I, I guess what I'm hearing, one of the things I'm hearing is that, okay, so there's 112 properties that need to be, that'll need to tie in. And so, you know, we, we, we do it up to the property line and then we just say, okay, you're on your own now, or do we help facilitate that somehow for, you know, where, where, um, you know, if it was my home, well, where do you go, right? Uh, you, you, I, I think property owners might be looking for some sort of direction from us of what is they're exactly supposed to do. And, well, we do have precedents in the community. We've done this before. So, uh, you know, it's what was done in the past. Yeah, we'll have to look at the past precedent of what we did uh, on those ones. But uh, I, basically, I'm, I was just working off what the bylaw states right now and our understanding that we'll likely have to revisit it with council for how we proceed with this one at that stage. Uh, Councillor Barkwell. It, it seems that um, requiring everybody to to, to uh, connect within 60 days of um, commissioning the system is kind of onerous. Uh, 
certainly I think it needs to be reviewed and considered and, and give people the, uh, the, the most amount of time that we can reasonably do. Uh, I know when I lived in Kelowna one time, a fellow was, had to connect and he was digging his big part of his by hand. You know, I think he worked on that for months. Um, it was a tough spot and he was ambitious and maybe he didn't have a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, long, you know, I, I hear you, you're going to review it. You'll probably come back with some period of time that's considerably longer than, than 60 days. So that's, that's great. Um, I had another question. I, I'd forgotten it right now. Hopefully I can come back. <laughs> We'll see. Councillor Van Alphen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So prior to going to the AAP, and we need 50% or better, um, will we be having a meeting with this specified sewer area group of people? You know, because I think we're missing the benefits here. Well, number one is the sewer. Number two is possible rezoning of their properties. A lot of these properties are quite large. They'll be able to probably accommodate uh, a carriage house or a secondary suite once the sewer goes in. Today, they can't because they're on septic. So how are we going to communicate the, the positives of this? Just, you know, basically what we're doing is saying, oh, it's going to cost you 19 grand, X amount of dollars a year, you in or you out. So I'd like to talk about the positives too. Do we want to take that, Corp Jackson? Um, so I can answer that through the chair to Councillor Van Elfman. So the um, the thirty day period is set to start on April nineteenth and then to close on May twentieth, which I actually believe is a holiday. So it'll be May twenty first. Um, so in that time, we could look at having um, some sort of like a, a public open house for the air or for the property owners in that area. We do have a bit of time before they would have to submit um, their petition against if they choose that or if they decide that they are against the project itself. Yeah. I think that'd be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Betts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just kind of to kind of close the circle on what I was getting at is just also um, I recognize you're saying we might come back with some recommendations on the timeline. Um, I just want to, again, kind of capture the point that expecting 112 properties to decommission a septic field on their property and do the works to connect their homes to the septic, we might not have enough contractors in the District of Summerland to accomplish that within that time frame, to, because that's large works on each of those properties. So I'm just trying to think of as a, the whole picture um, that we don't want to have Right now, the, the rules might not reflect what the capacity is in our building community. So, thank you. Councilor Park? Yeah, I remember now, I'd be, you're working on a drainage redesign for uh, Morrow Avenue and such, right? Will that be, um, will, it act, will that be ready to sort of tie in with construction for the sewer? I guess I know there's like, um, Drain, drain wells up at McClarty and Hermiston, and they're all connected. There's three of them, and, and the first one was full, and the second one was popping out, and the third one, you know, pouring into the other guy's garage. And it's just on the weirdest years, right? It's just, but it still needs to be done. So, yeah, is there going to be a, a tie in with that, or is that going to involve digging up the road again, or what? Uh, so, the mayor, we've integrated the storm related works for just the Moro stretch that we're going to be digging up on the, the steep part of Moro uh, into this project. They, it's, it's basically right in line with where the pipe's going to be going. So as we rebuild, we'll just accommodate that to be tied into a future project that you're talking about for the, the, like the, the larger scale storm project. So anywhere that we're tearing up right now that requires it, um, we'll be putting that back in um, as, as sort of per that design. So specifically, you'll be going with all the way up to Lake McClarty, McClarty and Hermiston and that intersection? Just with the storm bit, we'll yeah. just be doing the Moro bit. Uh, well, the Moro sort of goes up and then it the turns right. Moro bit. Oh, just, well, so did that just, just like the top half of just Moro? Just the top part of Moro, yeah. And then what about then the rest of Moro and all these other roads up there that, are they not part of this? 
They're and part of the sewer project. They're not part of the storm. Not the part of the project. storm. Mark. No, the no. storm is more down Moro, oh. down to the to Prairie Creek at the bottom. All right. Um, through the the fields down there. And the puddle at the bottom of Prairie or Moro. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Would someone like to bring forward a motion? Councilor Van Elton. Okay, could we get that up on the screen? Thanks. CEO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just as we do that, I see it's up there now. So on those other two pieces, just to, so I have clear direction, um, the desire for public open house for the residents of the Seward area to be invited to. So it's not an entire community kind of awareness thing. And most people wouldn't be as interested as those that are paying. Um, as one thing, and um, what was the second thing? It's lost my mind. Anyways, just clarity on the sixty days. Oh we'll yeah, have time. to work that out. Yeah, so staff can bring back some additional uh, considerations for councils for their debate on what a reasonable amount of time is, which I think itself would be informed by that open house. Yeah, and and how it's all going to work. You know, I think people yeah. want. But they'll want, they'll be asking that question in, in the open house anyway, right? So, okay. Uh, so we have the motion on the floor. Any further discussion, Councillor Trainer? Um, we recently did a sewer um, extension down in Trout Creek. Um, there's a couple of streets behind the hotel, um, so maybe we could see what they what the requirements were for them um, to tie in. I don't know what it was. I mean, it's a much small what. I heard you mumble well, something. That was a couple of months when I got here. Uh, the requirements were that they hook up within the 60 day time period. But my understanding was, I think there was only between 15 and 22 properties that uh, that were being uh, hooked in. So uh, smaller, smaller scale and what this project would look like, but it was 60 days. Yeah, and, and that was initiated initiated by them. I think it was smaller. I think uh, I I don't uh, um, what I remember, but maybe twenty years ago, the sewer was extended up to Pierre Drive, up up in that area. Um, you know, I think that was similar to this. A lot more houses, and um, and it was initiated by the district. Uh, I think so. Um, you know, that might be something to look into. Um, okay, any further discussion? Uh, I'll call the question, all in favor? And none opposed, that carries. Um, 8.1, uh, we have the uh, Bill of Application Procedures Bylaw for adoption. I'd like to bring that forward. This is we discussed this past third reading at last meeting. So adoption, Councillor Trainer, second, Councillor Patton, all in favor. That carries. No items removed from consent. Public uh, comment period. First up, I have uh, Sarah Seffler. So just come up to the podium, push the button. And uh, you have two minutes. There's a the timer there. So. <laughs> Sorry, just push. The, yeah, so the red light will come on. Yep. Oh, I live at 1281 McClarty Place, and I'm here to talk about the Deer Ridge uh, sewer extension. And I came to ask if you could please have an open house to talk to us residents who live there um, about all our concerns, because uh, we see that you've raised the construction price from 16000 to nearly 20000 but also uh, I have an estimate from a plumbing company right here. I have an uncomplicated property and it's going to be 25,000 to run a water line pipe from my house out to your sewer. And so we're talking, and I'm sure both of those costs could all escalate. And so when we're talking about perhaps 40,000 and 30,000, 70,000, dollars that you'd like us to spend and I don't even want it I have a perfectly working septic system that I think will work for another 10 or 15 years then I think that lots of other people in my neighborhood will have lots of questions so I certainly hope that you have an information day so we can all ask 
questions. And also, um, like, also the price that I was given by the contracting company does not include putting all our landscape, rockeries, pathways, driveways, trees, and fences back into place. That's on top of that. That's just digging the trench and connecting. And also, because you don't know exactly how much the construction is going to be, could you put a cap on it and that this district puts in for some of it when we get to a maximum number? Because if we approve it, we don't really know what the maximum um, amount of money is going to be. And also, I was told that at our property, it's going to take a week. So 112 properties needing this done it will um, take a lot longer than 60 days, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll be in touch with the date on that open house. Uh, Mr. Bessler. Hi, Council, Brad Bessler. This will be discussed tonight, but I wanna talk about the Bartlett Tree Service and the pre-written letters of support Thor Clausen got people to sign because nowhere in the letter does it mention the actual issues with the company. For example, the letter doesn't mention how Bartlett is an international non-farm company. This business is not locally owned. It just leases ALR land from a local resident for its operations. The letter doesn't mention how Thor Clausen is letting Bartlett use five times the allowable area for offices, shop space, and industrial vehicle and equipment storage. It must be noted that all other Bartlett locations in BC are on industrial land. This is the only one on designated farmland. The letter also fails to mention how Bartlett has over five times the allowable limit for employees at 18420 Garnet Valley Road. And let's be honest, Bartlett will still be around if it's required to move to a properly zoned industrial parcel. No jobs will be lost. The letter doesn't mention, and this is crucial, the letter doesn't mention how Thor Clausen allowed Bartlett to nearly double the size of its fleet of vehicles and equipment in 2022 and 2023, even after being ordered by the district to move off the ALR land. Nowhere in the letter does it mention how Bartlett trucks could still drop off any wood chip material, then park at a properly zoned parcel. And another thing, the mushroom farm doesn't even use wood chips as a substrate anymore. They use millet, which has nothing to do with Bartlett. And finally, the letter doesn't mention how Bartlett is required, if Bartlett is required to move to a properly zoned industrial parcel, there will be more room on the property for agricultural uses, such as expanding the mushroom farm. Thor Clausen in his pre-written letter intentionally left out key information to mislead people, but it's important that you all focus on the facts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Don't see any. Uh, I'd like to get a resolution to close the meeting to the public pursuant to sections 91 C, E, G, and I of the community charter. Councillor Van Elfen, Councillor Peak, all in favor? That carries. 